What I want to talk to you about uh, this afternoon is how we can use digital technologies uh, to reintroduce these, digit this, these objects, or digital representations of them at least, back into the world in which they were born. Um, and we want them to go back so they can be reused innovatively um, and as fuel for that creativity that Ian Livingston was talking about this morning. So we go, we're taking them on a journey back to the wild, back to the real world where they were born. So why would we want to do that? Well, we want to en them to enrich as, as a nation, um, to drive economic growth, uh, for social benefits, lots of reasons. So I'm going to talk, well, how, how are we going to do this? What, what are the ways that we're going about it? Well, the first thing I want to point out is that access is everything. Uh, if it isn't online, it doesn't exist. That's uh, uh, becoming a very common sort of saying within the sort of student community. Um, I was trained as a physicist, and I, when I was doing research, uh, if a paper wasn't an online PDF, you'd be much less likely to go off to the library and find and trawl through all the different volumes. Um, and, if, and before digitization, of course, uh, if you wanted to see something, you had to come physically to Aberystwyth. Um, and the National Library invested very early on in digitization, and possibly one of the main reasons for that was because we're based in Aberystwyth. Very central location, but not probably the easiest place for, us, for people to get to. Uh, and since the sort of the late 90s, really, we've been building up skills uh, and expertise in the field of digitization and preservation. A quick sort of interesting point, what I could today talk to you as well about digital um, preservation. Um, the time when authors uh, left their papers to us, uh, coming to an end, they're now leaving papers, yes, but they're also leaving us floppy disks, hard drives, um, maybe even the pass password to their Dropbox account. These are the things that we'll have to be dealing with as things go on. But I am going to focus on access and, 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 the, and the, the, the vast program that we've got of digitization. And the way that we want to move beyond just taking something and digitally photocopying it. How can the access, can we, how can we improve the access? I don't know how many of you have a, have a Kindle of an e-book reader. Um, a lot of people say, well, an e-book is not really the same as having a real book. Uh, uh, and I, I tend to sort of agree with that statement. Um, but very often, when we digitize something, a digital clock plate does have the capacity to tell you more about the original object than you could glean from actually sitting in front of it. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few examples. So the first, this is a, a picture of a, of a manuscript uh, that we have. So it, it's about the size of a, um, it would fit on, on the lectern there. You can see we have a, a, an image uh, in the middle. Now, high resolution scanning allows us to zoom in. We can get a little bit even more detail. We can get right in there and look at the very, very fine detail, something you possibly wouldn't be able to do by just sitting in the reading room and admire it. So, so there are added things, added value that you get from digital access. OK, high resolution scanning isn't exactly cutting edge, so we'll move on a little bit um, and talk a little bit about some hyperspectral imaging that we've been doing of our manuscripts. This is a project that we've done with Yale University. Uh, and basically, we're looking at the different wavelengths of light that are coming off this, these ancient um, medieval manuscripts. So as I click this, you'll see the arrow going across through the different wavelengths. And what you'll see is different emission coming out from uh, the, the manuscripts. And we can use this kind of information uh, to look at the pigments that were used um, at different features in the manuscript. Another sort of similar along the same kind of lines, uh, here we have a very exciting piece of slate. It's uh, great, and, and this is a project that we've been working on with the University of Kentucky. Um, and this is using a, pro uh, uh, a technology called RTI imaging. And basically what you do, you have a light source coming in at different angles, and you take a picture with a light source at different directions, uh, and you 
create a composite of those images. So effectively, what you have in the viewer is you can manipulate the light source. So as you change, and if you look really, really closely, um, you'll see that at different angles, you'll be able to bring out different features from the slate. So you'll see there's uh, uh, some inscriptions there becoming a bit more clearly as you manipulate it. Now, moving on to a little bit more modern texts. Um, th this is from our Welsh newspapers online resource. Um, we've, we've got over 7.4 million articles uh, at as part of our Welsh newspapers online resource. Um, they're not all Welsh language. About 75% of these articles are English language. And they're all there, sitting, waiting for you to log on and to search them. Um, and what we can do with newspapers uh, is we can look at, structure, at the structure of them. So we can start to identify different types of articles. Um, so whether they're an announcement, whether they're news reports, um, cart cartoons, illustrations. Uh, and very soon, uh, later on this month, we'll be launching an improved interface um, which will be the first of our resources to be launched on the new .cymru.wales domain. Um, and you'll be able to isolate um, sort of, uh, and identify and go through the illustrations, for example. So lots of extra exciting features on the way for you. Um, obviously, we can go beyond just uh, the structure. We can also extract the text. We can do OCR. Um, and you can go in and you can type in your place of birth or a relative's name and you can find all, all sorts of uh, things about black sheep and, and the family and so on. Um, but the advantages go beyond just searching. Um, they allow you to ask new research questions uh, about, um, for example, uh, the usage of words. Um, the example here um, from uh, our newspapers covering the First World War. Basically, how often the, f the phrase Belgian refugees appears uh, in the corpus of newspaper articles. Again, you can see this peak here at the time, right at the beginning of the war, when the refugees started flooding in, um, when they, um, and you can follow the patterns. And it's interesting, I don't know if this peak in 1918 is something, uh, we can speculate about what that is but you can see the potential and the power of having this data. And one of the things that we want to do as well is to start release this data so that other people can play about with it and can build exciting new tools on top of the data. Uh, and as well with a push for open data to make sure that we license it openly and as freely as possible. Now, access on its own is still not gonna be enough. Um, if you're just putting stuff up online uh, or whacking an API on top of some data, it doesn't mean that people are going to use it. Um, uh, and, and the next stage that we're looking towards is looking, getting people to engage with the data, engage with the objects themselves. Uh, and one of the ways that we've been uh, doing that is using crowdsourcing. Um, now, the added benefit of crowdsourcing, of course, if you, you get a useful output out of it uh, at the end, um, but if people start to engage with this content, they're much more likely to reuse it and to understand more about it and reuse it innovatively for the good of us as a nation. So a couple of uh, quick examples. Uh, this is a very, very simple um, crowdsourcing project where we basically uh, put up OS maps from 1900 online uh, and ask the crowd to type in what they saw, click on the map, uh, and type in uh, names of farms, uh, towns, streets, and so on. Uh, and within uh, a couple of months, we had a, a, a quite a comprehensive gazetteer of Welsh place names from 1900. Uh, and that's in itself a very, very valuable uh, asset that we can use to link and to identify places that exists that existed around that time. Another um, more ambitious, maybe uh, more advanced sort of crowdsourcing project that we've been involved with working with the Archives and Records Councils of Wales uh, is a project to crowdsource uh, tithe records. Uh, and what you have at the bottom here is a tithe schedule. 
and it's basically a list of the farms uh, and broken down into fields and it's got information like the, uh, the area of the field, what was grown there and how much tax there was due on that field. So again, we asked the crowd to, um, to transcribe the rows but also to identify the, num the fields which have been numbered in the maps. So we have maps corresponding to the tile schedules, uh, and we get them to, um, to, to identify the field and to link them together. So we're starting to get them some context and some structure into the data set. And the work, uh, and then the second uh, task that we got them to do was to georeference. So basically, to because um, the maps, the scale isn't always bang on because they're old maps. So we're effectively getting them to, to georeference, to identify places on the modern maps that exist on the old maps and, and tie those points together. And you're effectively morphing the map then to fit on top of the modern maps. Uh, and that's very, very powerful then as you take that content on searching, when you're searching for your farm, um, it doesn't appear somewhere to the left, it appears where you expect it to appear. Uh, and the work done as part of this Canavian project raises, uh, highlights an interesting uh, issue around the physical library and, and the physical building that I introduced to you at the beginning. Um, and very often, um, you'd have two pieces of collections. So you'd have on the left there a photograph, and on the right, you have a letter that that person wrote. Uh, and they're, they're going to be so stored separately, quite possibly, um, because of good environmental and, uh, reasons and preservation reasons. But what we want to do is to start to link these resources together uh, and give context to these items. And it's basically building knowledge and context on top of these collections. Uh, and I've already mentioned uh, the First World War, uh, and one project that we have at the moment uh, is a project called Wales at War. Uh, and it's a collaboration um, with a number of, of different partners. But in essence, the, the task here uh, is we're building a, a, an app where kids can go to their local war memorial, pick a name off the War Memorial and go off to the various online resources that we've got and start building biographies of uh, the servicemen. Uh, and of course, what you get then is you get this contextual linking between events, between people, um, and they give context to the items that we have. Another project that I felt I had to, to squeeze in again is not quite crowdsourcing, it's more group sourcing. Um, this is uh, some work where we got volunteers uh, at the National Library um, to transcribe some shipping records um, into Excel spreadsheets. Very, very simple thing to do. Um, and the information contained in these, um, you won't be able to read them possibly, but the information contained here um, basically list the names of all the crew members that joined or left a particular ship um, and any other interesting incidents, whether they fell overboard or, or whatever happened to them. And we, we're currently uh, working with the BBC to look at releasing this data as linked open data, so semantic data where we're encoding meaning uh, into the data and releasing it again openly uh, on a portal that we called NLW data that we're working on at the moment. Uh, and you can imagine that the wealth of information in this rich data set is quite interesting. Uh, a very, very almost lame example is we just took the ages of all uh, the persons joining their first ship. Uh, and and you, you see here that the peak is around 16 for people joining a ship uh, all the way down. Um, and you, you start to get a, a feel for the kind of information and the kind of research that you can do using this data. And again, the emphasis is on releasing this data so that other people can use and exploit it innovatively. And so you can imagine, can't you, sort of having a map uh, of the world and tracking the ships and the journeys that they went on and where the, the mariners went and so on. Um, 
And also, it opens up the possibility of linking to other collections. So um, we looked for one of the ships called Pluvier um, in our um, newspaper uh, archive. And we found here that they were that this, this ship collided with another schooner, uh, and it's recorded there in the newspaper. So we can, we can make that semantic link between those two. Um, another one we found was that there was some damage to the harbor, so Captain Thomas took a cargo of cement. So, so we can track and piece together the different the histories of these ships across collections. But even though the interest in and the importance of linking together these collections, the thrust of what I'm going after today is the way that we can also link outwards and the way that we want to link uh, collections together internally, yes, but as we start to identify the people, the places, the events, that we link them out into the real web, into the real world. And, and, and our aim really is to weave NLW into the web, so we link up to Wikipedia, that we link up to Wikidata, that we share our images on Flickr, all these things, so that we're releasing and introducing these objects that have been stuck inside this magnificent building in Aberystwyth and releasing them out. Why? Again, well, so that the people can innovate that with them, so that they're accessible, so that you can and we know, we know that the truly innovative uses of our collections will come from the outside. We have limited resources as well. Uh, we have, our role is to give access, to engage, get people engaged and to innovate. So as I draw to a close, um, I've shown you about a couple, a handful of examples, but this is your digital library. Um, it's owned by the people of Wales, um, and the potential here is massive. Um, we, uh, and and I, I showed you at the beginning what we have. What you have here is just the tip of the iceberg. This is only the beginning of what we are trying to do, only the beginning of the process of this journey to bring back these objects into the wild and weave them into the world of today. And I'm going to leave you with one example. Uh, you may be thinking, well, cultural heritage, it's all, it's all very nice, but what does it have to do um, with my domain? Um, well, I want to finish with, with an example here, uh, and this is an initiative that we're talking about at the moment, uh, Book of You, and basically it's, this is an app that's being developed um, to help dementia sufferers. Um, uh, and, and the idea is that patients... Um, with the help of their carers, create an e-book of their memories and of things that they remember. Uh, and we've been, we, we're working with uh, this initiative to be able to contribute possibly some of our photojournalistic collections so that people, uh, so they, they can be used in this project. So, I'm going to finish. So over to you. So what can you do? I've given you a, a very, very small glimpse uh, of what we have, uh, of the ideas, of the things that we think you could do with them. But I wonder what kind of exciting opportunities lie for your business or for your organization. How can you use these creatively? How can you innovate with these assets? The assets, they're owned by you um, and they're there. They're coming back into the wild they were born free, and we were trying to take them back into the wild. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Owen. Um, has anyone any questions they would like to pose to Owen before he escapes off the stage, <laughs> that is? Gentlemen here. Just wondering if um, if anything inspired you to uh, to take the model that you did, and what I mean by that is somebody who'd been down the road before, whether it was a, a British one or a foreign uh, digital exchange or library or showcase, something you took as a model. In, in terms of the individual projects, or yeah, something you took as a, as a yeah, so so, project so project. The, the the there's a very vibrant sort of library community and and. For example, one of, the, one of the most obvious ones in the library world in terms of 
the OCRing of the newspapers, uh, the National Library of Australia um, took their newspaper corpus and they did OCR on it, so they, they, they turned into text using computers and they found out the results that weren't exactly spot on. So one of the things that they did was they turned to the crowd and got people to uh, correct the, the newspaper OCR, which of course gets fed back in uh, and is a benefit uh, to everybody else using it. Uh, and it's surprising uh, the way people, you know, I, I found myself, you know, you start, oh, I'll, I'll do just one, uh, and, and after about two hours, you sort of think, oh, I probably should stop now. It's quite an addictive thing, uh, and it's quite an intrinsic sort of um, urge, I suppose, that to want to, to get things looking correctly. If you see lots of question marks and asterisks, where a perfectly legible word is there, uh, you'll want to correct it. So, so yeah, th there are various uh, projects going on. That's, that's the most obvious one I'd, I'd mention. Great. Anyone else? Gentleman is to the back, to the right. How do you actually go about prioritising your digitisation then? And how can the people of Wales, if you like, contribute to deciding what gets done? Right. Well, um, there are a couple of, couple of things. Um, there are a couple of drivers for digitization. I mentioned uh, preservation is possibly one, um, where if something is very fragile state, you might want to, to digitize for, for preservation. But our aim and our, our, is for it to be demand-driven. So um, this is, is not always easy. Um, we are working, and our, our digital access team um, are working. So if you have ideas in terms of use cases, if you, if you want to see a specific collection um, digitized, it's always good for us to, um, to, 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 to be notified and for people to tell us what they want digitized. Because we're sitting there in the room, and there's a massive pile of stuff, <laughs> and choosing which thing to go first. And to a certain extent, everybody will want a different uh, thing digitized. So it's based mainly on demand, but also on what we think uh, there would be of most interest and of strategic interest. The newspapers, I think, have turned out to be a very good um, sort of core to go for and very thing, obvious thing to go for because, you know, the newspapers have potential links out to everything. They report on the matters of the day. You have these events, you have adverts, you have... So, 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 that, so, so it's a blend. Uh, of reasons, but we always strive to be demand-driven and, and to go after where communities exist that want access to this stuff. Um, but it, it's a hard one to, uh, to get right, um, but we try our best. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, I'm very fascinating. Um, I, it's really good to see how uh, you know, crowdsourcing and volunteering has been used to digitise uh, a lot of these assets um, uh, for the benefit of the country. Mm -hmm.